Have you ever poked around those lists of 10 best places to live? Uh, you know, they, they come out with them all over the place all the time. I was looking, I saw, I was looking around uh, last week on a various websites. One was called Moving Waldo. Who knew there was a website called Moving Waldo that lists the 10 most desirable towns and cities in Canada based on uh, three criteria, safety, uh, affordability, and proximity to parks. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, that, that's an interesting set of pr criteria, but I, I'm always looking on those lists to see if maybe Cochrane might be in it. <laughs> And uh, I looked on the list, and sure enough, Cochrane was not on that list. Uh, in fact, uh, whoever made the list must live in eastern Canada because there was only one town west of Ontario on the list. It was number eight, and it was High River, Alberta. So apparently frequent flooding doesn't uh, count, doesn't figure into, the, into the, the criteria there. And then I started looking and, and just list of 10 best places to live in Alberta. And I thought, surely Cochrane will be on that list. But there were several lists that I looked at and Cochrane was not on a single one of them, which, which was actually sort of surprising because Cochrane used to appear on some of those lists quite frequently, uh, which leads me to think that maybe those lists are sort of self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, you know, a place becomes very desirable for everybody to move, a whole bunch of people move there, and then suddenly it's not as desirable as it, as it used to be. And if you follow that, uh, follow that reasoning to its conclusion, you would come to kind of the conclusion that maybe the best place to live is where there are not very many other people living there. Uh, but uh, that's not what the text that I want to look at today says. It's in Psalm 133. Uh, this summer our church was uh, looking through some, some of the Psalms of Ascent I don't think we got to this one, uh, but I'm, I'm, I really was enjoying these Psalms of Ascent, and, and I don't think I've ever preached on this particular one, and, uh, and I just felt like the Lord was leading us to think about it today. Uh, Psalm 133, a song of ascents of David. It says, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. It is like fine oil on the head, running down the beard, running down the Aaron's beard onto his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon falling on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has appointed the blessing, life forevermore. Uh, a psalm of a sense, it says it is good and pleasant when brothers dwell together, live together in harmony. Good means appropriate. It means uh, functional. It means uh, within its genre, it is good, like good food. It's, it's just, uh, it's, it's a positive sort of just goodness. It's right. And then added to that is it's Pleasant, which brings in the, the, the connotation of enjoyable, pleasurable, something that brings delight and joy to our heart. It's both good and pleasant when brothers dwell together in harmony. Uh, this was um, a psalm of ascent that the people would sing as they were going out on pilgrimage to head to Jerusalem for one of the three major uh, festivals that they would have there every year, three times a year. It was like a massive family reunion, uh, family reunion on a grand scale. All the people, all the children of Israel, all the different tribes gathering together, and they, and they would get on the road, and the thing about it, if you think about it, the closer they got to Jerusalem, the worse the traffic would become. And then when they got there, they were going to be in a city 
uh, with uh, 10 times as many people as it typically had in it, probably at least. And with all of these distant, crazy relatives and a family reunion. Do you have family reunions? Does your family have reunions? You know, it's uh, when the church I pastored used to have, there was a season of the year I just called family reunion season because everybody be gone. There'd be half the people be gone every week going to family reunions that they did every year. And uh, if you've done those, you over time, those sometimes develop into places where you're meeting strangers, people you don't really know, or people who have annoyed you over the years. Sometimes getting together with family is not always easy. There would be plenty of opportunity for conflict among this family as they gathered in Jerusalem. Uh, so they sang this song as a reminder. You know, it was... It was also true that this family had not always been, had a great track, track record of unity. Uh, they had, well, you think about their, their common ancestor was a guy who had caught his brother at a vulnerable moment when he was famished and starving out in the wilderness and, and convinced him to sell him his birthright for a bowl of stew. And then he had deceived his aging father uh, by dressing up in some sort of weird getup. I never can. It's hard to imagine what that must have looked like or smelled like with him tying those animal skins on him and going up to, to his father Isaac and, and conniving and getting the family blessing out of him and made his brother so angry that he had to leave town for decades. That was the start of this family. And then the 12 sons of that ancestor had been, had practiced such good brotherly love that uh, the older ones uh, picked out one of the younger ones that they found extremely annoying and sold him to some passing human traffickers to take him off to be a slave in a foreign country. So, yeah, not a great history of togetherness in this family. And their unity had always been kind of tenuous, even when they were together. And God, they, God had made them into a great nation. They had had different tribes. They had gone into, um, God had led them through the wilderness and brought them to into the promised land, given them a land of their own. And yet there was always this distinctness and some division. And, and at one point, David, uh, as they finally came together under his rule, they had been sort of together, but they, there was some conflict even at that moment. And they finally came together. He established the capital in Jerusalem as, as a place where they could gather in unity. And maybe it was around that time that he wrote this psalm, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. And, and then as they hit the road three times a year going up to Jerusalem, they would sing the song to remind themselves, yes, this is good. This, this is pleasant. At least it can be pleasant. At least it should be pleasant. Even though eventually that unity broke down, during those years they would, they would remind themselves time after time that it's good for us to dwell in unity. That the best place to live is in harmony with God's people. Um, they had plenty of sibling rivalry, you know, and sibling rivalry would be the kind of stuff that, yeah, you know what it is, just arguing over resources, jealousy, envy, petty, strife, all of those kinds of things. Really, sibling rivalry boils down to what's fair and who's right, but it's good and pleasant for God's people, for God's, to, for brothers to dwell together in harmony. How does it happen in the middle of, of all of this? Uh, well, it, it might be good for us just to look at uh, uh, this, um, 
these images. It describes what it's like. The first one, honestly, this may be one reason I've never preached on this passage. I could never quite get my head around this first image. It says it's like oil, fine oil poured on the head, poured on the head, flowing down the hair, flowing down Aaron's beard. I mean, we're, we're not talking a crew cut and a nicely shaped goatee here. We're talk, it's more ZZ Top. You guys, you guys know, some of you don't even know who ZZ Top, there was this band, you know, forget it. You know, it's more like, let's see, is Ike's here today? Ike's is, or it's, it's like Josiah, give him, give him a few years of, uh, give him a couple more years of growth, and this is what we're looking at, you know? This is, this is oil flowing down, a whole lot of hair, a whole lot of beer. And it's not, uh, it's not just a little dab of oil. It's not a symbolic sort of anointing on the head. It's not a little bit of oil spread on the skin like a moisturizer. This is, this is Costco. It's going down to Costco and buying one of those eight liter tins of oil and popping the lid and just pouring it on, just drenching the head of, of Aaron, uh, this, this oil flowing down, soaking his hair, dripping off his beard onto his robes. I just want to go gross. Make, just thinking about it makes me want to take a shower, doesn't it, you? What, what's so good and pleasant about that? Well, it probably has something to do with the purpose of that oil as in that process of priestly consecration consecration and anointing that god had made it possible for them to have a priest he had given them instructions for them to have a priest to stand before him on their behalf to stand before them and to speak for him to administer the sacrifices of atonement. And that, that process included a lot of mess. It included blood sprinkled and splashed everywhere. It included the pouring out of oil over his head as an expression of God's spirit on this man's life. And of God's, that blood, of God's cleansing, as Jerry talked about last week, that this generous cleansing, this generously pouring out of God's Spirit in, in his life. This, this was an image that would remind them of the outrageous generosity of God, cleansing them, forgiving them, bringing them into refla- to relationship with him. It was, a, it was an act that also called them to delight in God's voice, to delight in God's presence, to worship him with abandon. He had spoken, God had spoken, and he was with them. And he invited them into spontaneous, joyful living of consecration, of holiness, and obedience. Even this act of anointing was an act of obedience to the Lord. So, being together as God's people is good and, pl- and pleasant when we share an extravagant delight in the grace and the holiness of God. Note that it's both in his grace and in his holiness, delighting in his holiness as well as his grace. God never poured out his grace on his people that he didn't also call them to holiness, by the way. Uh, grace without holiness is just validation. It's just presumption. But God was calling them to a life together of delighting in, in his gift of grace and holiness. I think that's, that's part of it. Then there's this other image, the dew of Mount Hermon falling on Jerusalem. Did you, did you catch that? It's the dew of Hermon. Falling on Jerusalem. Hermon was not anywhere near Jerusalem. It took Elijah 40 days to walk there. It was, uh, but Hermon was a place that had this amazing dew, thick dew that would fall. You know, they don't get a lot of rain in that part of the, part of the world, but, 
but a lot of the life comes from the dew that falls from the sky. And Herman would have snow on the on the peak almost all year round but down along the around the the foothills lower down on the mountain there would be this amazing dew that made it this lush kind of paradise this thick heavy dew that would fall morning by morning replenishing and giving life to that whole mountainside and and David is saying here when people when God's people, when brothers dwell together in unity, it's like the dew from Hermon falling on the mountains around Jerusalem. Not quite as lush, not quite as nice, rockier, not too, not known for its lush vegetation. Uh, this was this was a, a an abundance that was out of place. It was a, a surreal kind of provision that that would be made he said living together in unity being together with god's people is good and pleasant when we live together in the surreal and abundant provision of god that it it just it's so good it seems like how can this actually be here right now in this place it doesn't even belong here uh, I know a lot of you hike. I like to hike a little bit. Probably not to I'm probably not as hardcore as some of you guys, but there's nothing like climbing a peak somewhere and coming to that pinnacle and seeing the amazing beauty spread out before you. Or, you know, during COVID, Sherry and I got sort of desperate. We got some snowshoes and started get it just to get out, you know, get out somewhere and we go into somewhere in the in the mountains and just get out and trudge along in those snowshoes and hike back up into the woods somewhere you know that amazing crisp silence that that you experience in the woods on a cold winter day with the snow have you have you experienced that wow just an amazing space amazing moment I think what he's saying here is, is that when God's people are together, it's like having that right in the middle of the city, wherever you are. Having those surreal kinds of experiences all the time because God's people are together in unity. It's, it's an amazing, it's, the, it's, it's, an, it's like living on a on a different plane. It's like living in a, a space that doesn't exist anywhere else. This is what it looks like. When God's people live together, it's like this unbridled, joyful abandon in light of God's extravagant grace in our lives. And it's like this awestruck delight in the midst of God's surreal and abundant, super abundant provision uh, for our lives. But how do we get there? How do we get to that kind of unity, to that kind of space? You know, I, sometimes we think if we could just get to doctrinal uniformity, that we'd have, we'd have real unity as God's people. When I was a kid, um, my dad was in ministry and I would go with him to meetings and conventions and stuff and just hang out sort of eavesdrop over his, his conversations with his, with his friends. These guys had all been trained and grown up in a season when the big issue of the day was eschatology. It was all about eschatology. You were the pre-millennial, you're post-millennial. Which kind of millennial are you? Dispensational? Are you historical? Are you pre-trib? You post-trib? You know, they had lots of ways to to be divided on eschatology, and uh, and it was like you know, well, they they would label one another, you know, according to how they felt, how they came out on eschatology. They talked about each other. It was like, okay, he's, you know, he's a millennial. What could he possibly have to say that, that I want to hear, you know? Or, 
you know, he's he's premillennial. I'm premillennial, but he's a he's a historical premillennialist. I mean, pff, what uh, you know? I I don't. How can you trust a person? You know, do they really be- love God? You know, or they think they think that you're gonna we're gonna be raptured before the tribulation. They they can't possibly love Jesus as much as I do. I'm willing to go through the tribulation. You know. And as my dad and his friends would talk about that, they had gotten to the point where they they would joke about it, and they'd say, "Oh, I'm pro, you know, I'm all for it," or "I'm pan, you know, it's going to pan out in the end, or whatever." They, and what they were saying was, "I can't believe we we ever made that big of a deal over that stuff," you know. And yet we always have something we're making a big deal over, don't we? Uh, we. I, the year I started college was a year a huge controversy started in, in our denomination. And honestly, over the last 40, 45 years, it's been one after another. And each time, the, the idea is if we could just get to uniformity, everybody using the right words, everybody using the right terms, everybody coming down exactly the same, then we would finally have that amazing unity that God's people are supposed to have. Can I just tell you an observation of, of an old man who's watched this for a while? You never get to unity through theological uniformity. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because, you know, ironically what happens is you just start canceling people who disagree with you. Never going to get there. So, you know, I, as a young man, I said, well, what we need to be united about then is mission. You know, that we don't, we're not going to be united by theological uniformity. Let's be united by mission. God has sent us on mission. This is the thing that unites us. Uh, I've been doing this, being a missionary for 26, 7 years now. And I can tell you that doesn't really do it either because there are lots of different ways to do the mission. Everybody's got their opinion about how to do the mission. And uh, there's, there's all kinds of different, you can, you can sort of put your differences aside, you know. And one of, the, one of the, our typical ways to trying to come to unity is through diplomacy. You know, I'll, I'll give here, you give there, I'll overlook that, you'll forgive this, let's... Let's sort of come down to a, a, a common agreement. But, and that might lead us to having some pretty good teamwork, but it doesn't lead us to good and pleasant unity. How does that happen? You know, when, I, uh, when they were going, let's, let's think about these Psalms of Ascent as they were as they were leaving, as they were going to these, these festivals, they would go to the Passover. And at the Passover, they were remembering, they were celebrating, commemorating the fact that God had gloriously and miraculously delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And they would, they would sacrifice that lamb, and they would celebrate the Passover, and they would eat that meal, and then they would eat the unleavened bread in the week after that, and they would, it would just remind them of that glorious thing that God had done in delivering them. And then uh, a few weeks uh, later, they would, uh, five weeks later, they would come back and celebrate Pentecost, and, and remember how God had brought them into the land, and how he had, had, provided this promised land for them. It was a place of amazing abundance. And then a little later in the year, they would celebrate the stuff in between. They'd have the Feast of Booths, and they would, they would all go camping together and, and, uh, and live in tents and remind themselves of how God had sustained them, blessed them, led them, made them into a people in the wilderness and provided manna for them day by day. They were, and every time, and then, and then as, they, as they went up to Jerusalem to celebrate these, they would sing this song, 
It's good and pleasant to live in harmony. What were they doing? They were remembering, they were celebrating all of God's great acts among them, all of the things that he had done. And, and, and in this poem, the way it talks about it, you notice how many times things are coming down? You know, he, he, twice he mentions that the oil runs down on Aaron's, down on the beard, down on Aaron's beard. And then, and then it says it's like dew falling from uh, on the dew of Hermon falling on Jerusalem. Same word, same Hebrew word about the descent. That there's there's uh, a lot of commentators look at this and say there's a sense that everything, all of this, is something that comes from above and it comes down, and they are celebrating the gracious, mighty acts of God, of how God has blessed. And don't we have even more of the story to celebrate? As we celebrate the fact that God has in Christ reconciled us to himself. And this is, this is what I think it's telling us, is that we find our best life and community when we simply enjoy God together. When we simply enjoy what God has done in us, what he's doing in us, what he's accomplished for us in Christ, and how his spirit has come to dwell in each and every one of us. This is how we get to that sort of surreal, amazing unity, is when we just, you know, put all the other stuff aside and enjoy God together. Uh, it has been uh, one of the greatest gifts that God has given to me in my life uh, to to serve on these on this uh, faculty uh, since that time in 2006 seven when the Lord led us here and you know we're not all alike did you guys know that <laughs> yeah I know you know that you talk about it we know you talk about it you, you talk about us we're not all alike. We don't even necessarily agree on everything, you know. We had different opinions and different stuff, you know. Our personalities are, are different. We do things differently. We run classes a little differently, probably. Some of, some of us are better at Turabian than others, you know. But through the years, we've experienced God's grace together we've uh, we've pursued his holiness together we have stood in awe of his provision and the things that he's doing in front of our eyes the things he's doing in your lives the things he's doing in in ours uh, we've We've watched one another <laughs> grow from middle age to boarding on old age, you know. And through the seasons of life and the ups and downs and the, the tragedies, the difficulties, the sorrows, the joys, we've experienced God. We've gathered around and celebrated what God has done in Christ, what he's done on the grand scale in the world and what he's done in each one of, one of our lives. And, and sometimes that delight is just surreal. How did, how did we get here? How do we get to be here in this place? Experiencing the blessing of the Lord, as the Psalm says. It's good. It's pleasant. It's an extravagant expression of God's grace and holiness, like oil flowing down the beard of Aaron. It's a surreal delight, like the dew of Mount Hermon falling in Jerusalem. You know, there, there are plenty of ways. I, I love hearing you guys testimonies this morning about uh, how this community has already been a place of of discovery and joy and unity and appreciation for you let me tell you there are there are plenty of ways 
to be uh, for division to happen on this hill. You know, living in close proximity, sharing uh, resources, uh, throw kids into the mix. You've got different parenting styles, all of that going on. Uh, just little irritations and annoyances. There's always a possibility for doctrinal disagreements and bickerings over nuances. I'm not talking about the basic. I mean, you know, the Bible's true. The gospel's powerful. Everybody needs to hear it. That we we agree. I'm talking about the different nuances of of our thinking about about theology. There are always possibilities. Different styles. Just like sibling rivalry, we can get divided over what's fair and who's right. And we have a cornucopia of cultures here. There's plenty of opportunity for misunderstanding there as well. But could we, could we just commit together? Could we just decide together that when we look around and see one another, we will always look and see the work of God in them. Look at, I just want to enjoy what God is doing in you, what I see of him in you. Could we simply just enjoy God together? Could we just rejoice every day in the mighty works that God has done to bring each one of us to this place and savor and enjoy that extravagant, extravagant gift of his grace. When we do that, it's going to be good and pleasant every day. And we'll be living our best life in the best place to live on earth. Why would we want to live anywhere else? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for... Uh, your word that encourages us, that pulls us forward into uh, our life with you and with one another. And Lord, we, we want to look around and see one another and see you in each face. Lord, help us to, uh, day by day, have our, our minds, our hearts, focused on you that we might love one another the way that we need to and lord that that uh, we might dwell together in unity and that the world around us would see how good and pleasant it is uh, lord teach us daily to live in this place in this way in jesus name amen <laughs>